Okay, so um, before we get to uh, our keynote uh, speaker, we'd like to play a short video from Northrop Grumman. Somewhere past the edge of convention, beyond the boundaries of tomorrow, lies a special kind of impossible. A kind of impossible where pioneers forge ahead. Where no idea is too bold and no challenge too great. Because making a 200 ton airplane disappear is impossible. Until it's not. Predicting cyber attacks before they happen is impossible. Until it's not. And solving the mysteries of the universe is impossible. Until it's not. It's our job to break free from what is. To what could be. Ready to leave the boundaries of what's known. To define the possible. Northrop Grumman is not only a corporate member of AS, but a good friend and supporter of the society. Uh, they're a global aerospace and defense company of about 97,000 women and men working on the nation's most challenging missions for aeronautics, advanced weapons, missiles, integrated systems, and of course, space. Headquartered in Northern Virginia, Northrop Grumman supports NASA, NOAA, the Department of Defense, and many other government agencies. Uh, and commercial space customers with facilities across the country and around the world. Northrop Grumman has also been a longtime supporter of the American Astronautical Society and, of course, uh, our many events, including, of course, the Goddard Symposium. Marty Frederick is Northrop Grumman's Corporate Director of Civil Space Programs, a member of the AS Board of Directors, and a good friend. Marty, turn it over to you to introduce our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, very much. And uh, I got to say, it's an honor and a privilege to be up here representing Northrop Grumman today and introducing our lunch and keynote speaker, Dr. Nikki Fox. Uh, before I introduce uh, Nikki, I just want to say this has been great. Uh, I participated in the, the hybrid option for attending the conference. The first two days, I was mostly paying attention online, uh, tried to block off as much of my calendar as I could, but being here in person, really makes a difference. And I'm hoping that we're gonna be moving more and more towards those being together and uh, getting the face-to-face -face and maybe a little less masks at some point in time when it's ready. So uh, thanks for having me here. Thanks for allowing us to be able to sponsor here, Jim. Uh, it's been great. Uh, I'm really glad you went through the thank yous for everybody that contributed. I echo those as well. Uh, you can tell that the planning committee, Michelle and Steve uh, and your whole team they, they really paid off. All the hard work paid off. I know how hard that is. So uh, on to Nikki Fox. So uh, Dr. Fox is the Heliophysics Direct Division Director and the Science Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C. If you're attending this symposium and you saw the previous panel, then you don't need me to explain the importance of her position. Uh, Northrop Grumman uh, and many other of the industry partners here participate in, uh, in uh, Nikki's uh, programs. We're very fortunate to have one with uh, NASA Ames Research Center, the Heliophysics Midex, Helioswarm. We're hoping to fill in some of those gaps we talked about. Very, very much looking forward to that. Until 20, August 2018, Nikki worked for the Applied Physics Lab, where she was chief scientist for heliophysics and the project scientist for NASA's Parker Solar Probe, and I think that that's where I first met you. Uh, humanity's first mission to a star. Before working at APL, she also worked at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. Uh, Nikki's bio confirms she's a proven executive leader and an accomplished scientist. Uh, I encourage all of you to look her up on the internet. Uh, it's a really impressive uh, uh, set of accomplishments she has. Um, and, and she's part of a really great team at NASA's Science Mission Directorate. Uh, while it's unfortunate uh, Thomas Rapukin couldn't be here today because of uh, uh, he's not feeling well and can't join us, uh, I know that each member of uh, his team, including Nikki uh, and SMD leadership, can step in and represent NASA science equally well. So um, we're very much looking forward to hearing an SMD, maybe with a hint towards heliophysics, right? So uh, I would be remiss if I didn't add that Dr. Fox is a, is a tireless advocate for diversity and inclusion 
especially inspiring girls and supporting young women in STEM fields. She shared with me recently that she just spoke to a group of, of Girl Scouts uh, talking about uh, breaking down gender stereotypes and the way that she's going about doing it is really, really interesting. Try and grab her and talk to her about that. She's also, she and her colleagues are also uh, supporting uh, an activity called Mentoring 365, a program to make online connections to provide advice to early and mid-career women, especially during the isolation of pandemic, making face-to-face -face where, um, making connections where face-to-face -face, uh, networking can't be possible. So that's a very important time during the isolation of, of, of the pandemic. Since I contend that nurturing the next generation of STEM leaders starts at home, I will mention here that Nikki is the mother of two children, James and Darcy, who keep her very busy. She describes herself as a walking wallet and Uber driver. Please welcome Nikki Fox. Well, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. I really do apologize uh, that Thomas is not here. For those of you who know Thomas, you know he must be really sick if he didn't come out to give this talk today. Um, but I am delighted to be here. Um, as, uh, as Marty said, I think we are an amazing team at SMD right now. The, the, uh, the environment that Thomas fosters as a leader really is that we all work together. And it, it is very true that we all can can sort of pinch hit for one another and we all get excited about each other's um, experiences. And I'll, I'll also note that Karen St. Germain landed this morning and helped me with talking points for the earth science slide while she was still taxiing. So thank you, Karen. Uh, <laughs> um, and so, yes, as Marty said, uh, Mentoring 365 is a very important program. If you are not, it is actually, it's not just for women, it is for men and women. Um, and uh, actually everybody, uh, all genders, all any, any gender identity you associate with, that is there for you. Um, so please, if you are not already signed up as mentors, there's awesome people in this room. We need mentors for these early career, early and mid-career people to help them um, be able to, to really move on to the next level. Um, but with that, uh, so, it is true there might be a tiny helio bent in this talk. So I did take the, um, the speaker's prerogative to change the first chart. And so with that, I am going to uh, uh, give you a tribute to uh, Dr. Gene Parker. I hope that movie is actually running. It is not. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Parker was born in 1927 in Houghton, Michigan. Um, he went on to do his uh, bachelor's at uh, the University of Michigan State, so that wouldn't win any prizes with Thomas, by the way. And then uh, he did his PhD at Caltech. He then was briefly at the University of Utah before he went to the University of Chicago in 1955, where he stayed for the remainder of his career. In 1957, fortunately for all of us, he got really interested in a problem called coronal heating. And he described it to me as, you know, I just solved a few equations, Nikki. And um, I came up with this theory that said that the atmosphere of the sun would move away in a supersonic way. And he wanted to call it the solar wind and by golly, he did. When he published his paper, it was not met with very, um, very endorse, you know, ringing endorsement. And one of the reviewers actually said, wow, if you're gonna publish in this area of science, you should probably go to the library. And then Gene said to me, and that was the nice review. Um, but fortunately for us, uh, his colleague, um, Chandra Sakar, uh, also at the University of Chicago, and then soon to after that to win a Nobel Prize himself, uh, said, you know what? I can't find a damn thing wrong with this paper. That's a direct quote. Um, you know, you're a nuisance. I don't like it, but I'm going to publish it. And uh, so it was published. And uh, Gene is very proud of that piece of work. And in 1962, obviously, NASA's Mariner 2 spacecraft on its way out to Mercury actually sensed the solar wind. And Gene was right. Um, in uh, 2017, Gene became the first person to have a NASA mission named after him during some of their lifetime. And um, in August of 2018, at the age, the young age of 91 years, he stood and, uh, and watched his legacy spacecraft, the spacecraft that bore his name, take off. And so sadly, um, on March 15th, beware the Ides of March, uh, Gene passed away sleep, uh, peacefully in his sleep, um, leaving an enormous hole in the whole community because not only did he really, I th and I think it's no overstatement to say without Gene, Heliophysics would not be what it is, 
but he also had profound impacts on astrophysics and on planetary science too. And so on March 15th, we lost a giant in our community. Uh, Jean is the winner of the 2020 Crawford Prize in Astronomy, and I do have the privilege next month of traveling with his family to actually receive the award on behalf of the family. So I'm a God talk about a career moment. Uh, really, it's just, just you know, when, when I got the call to say um, he, he passed, I thought oh, if we could have just had another month, he could have heard all of the, the amazing things that uh, the colloquium speakers will say about him. But I guess he will just be in heaven looking down and hearing us. And as Thomas said, his name will orbit the sun fair. Ever. So with that, um, I will go to the next chart. So, so one thing that Jean did was, you know, really sort of inspire and, and give hope to, uh, to a whole generation of scientists. And along with that hope um, comes the, the Lucy mission. And Lucy was launched in October, October 16th of last year with this very, very, very beautiful yeah. plaque um, on, uh, on on the, on the spacecraft written by, I'm sure you all remember Amanda Gorman and the way she just knocked it out the park at the inauguration, but she is the National Youth Poet Laureate. And she wrote this beautiful poem that I'm gonna try and read. And I should have, should, I wish I'd been like Marty and printed out notes, but she wrote, blessed be the people who see the dream in the bones of Lucy, that the worlds braved by humankind be worlds that leave us humans kind. Let each dawn find us courageous heeding the light forevermore. May ancient hope implore us at our uncom uncompromising core to keep rising for an earth more than worth fighting for. And if that doesn't inspire hope in everybody, and it's the thing is, yeah, it's really, really applicable to Lucy, but it's applicable to everything we do at NASA. Science is hope. Science, it, it, science is just a hopeful, hopeful thing. We are always, we're always pushing the boundaries. We're always doing more. And with Lucy, we're kind of going back in time. So Lucy will go and, and look at the Trojan asteroids. Um, and actually, I think, I, I can't remember how many, but it's a large number that, uh, that the spacecraft is gonna encounter starting in 2027. And the really interesting thing about that is they're really sort of the building blocks of our planet. So the building blocks of our solar system. And not only that, it is, you know, we think that, um, they, that our atmosphere and our, our water, our seas and oceans may actually have been impacted and may have, you know, been sort of had made, uh, changed by impacts from these um, sort of primordial uh, uh, beings or bodies. And so by actually going and studying them, it actually helps us kind of look back and understand our origins of, of the solar system. And so talking of looking back, I can't wait to get to the next chart. So if uh, yet more impressive things, um, but you know, uh, Webb allowing us to look back in time even further by looking in the infrared, allowing us to see through the opaque, to see sort of around other stars, to see galaxies, to see, um, to see things before further back in time than ever possible, which I think is just truly inspirational because obviously due to COVID, we were not able to get together in, in the large group, um, either at Space Telescope Institute or at Goddard hosted by Anne. Um, but, you know, we had a bit of a festive atmosphere in my house. Uh, you know, I have, as, as Marty said, young children. So Christmas morning for me is usually, can I open my presents yet? Can I open my presents yet? <laughs> so, um, Instead of that, my, my kids knew that uh, both myself and my husband were like living and dying by this particular launch. And so they pi everyone piled into our room. And when my parents were also visiting, so there's all six of us in this little bed, you know, um, with um, watching in, on the big screen that I had set up in the, the, the launch. And my kids are very used to being around NASA. So it's, it's kind of fun to see them going, oh, look, it's Dr. Z. It's Dr. Z. He's on the screen. And um, me lighting up every time I saw Greg Robinson uh, to the point that, um, my daughter would start going, hey, Greg, hey, every time you came on the screen. And it was just such a wonderful moment to, e even though we were not with our colleagues, you know, we were there together as a family and it was such an amazing launch. Talk about a picture perfect launch. And I also had the privilege um, before launch actually of, of attending an Alan Alder symposium um, with a, a large number of the web team. And so I actually had all this sneak previews of, of, of all the things they were going to talk about at the web launch. So that made it even more exciting. And uh, then earlier this week, we were given, or actually last week, I'm sorry, we were given this, this present, um, this amazing, amazing image. 
and I'm gonna see if I can actually remember. I'm, I'm always teaching my kids you need to remember things. So this is two mass J 1755 4042 plus 655 1277. Drops mic. Um, <laughs> Um, and no, I don't have that in front of me, I swear to you, I don't. Um, so uh, this is actually colorized with a red filter to really make it much more, much more poppy. Um, and uh, so we're looking at this and we all said, um, wow, look at that star, it's so amazing. And Paul Hurt said, never mind the star, look at the galaxies behind it. And it really shows um, just how amazing a tool this is. So this is, you know, after the fine phasing is complete, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I've spent a lot of time around uh, the, the Webb telescope and the, the, you know, the excitement of it, but just the sheer feat of getting all of those mirrors aligned to be able to do this. And the only thing we're waiting for, as Antonella said earlier today, is the science. And, and you know, I just cannot wait to see the science that this, that this um, produces. And so, you know, uh, Webb giving us um, wonderful, wonderful um, uh, images. Uh, you know, and also showing a real sort of um, collaboration, as Antonella talked about, all the international collaboration that it really takes to do this. Another great long-standing example of that international collaboration is, of course, the International uh, Space Station. And here, you're actually looking at a NASA astronaut, Kayla Brown, on a uh, Expedition 66, doing a six-hour and 54-minute spacewalk. Now, uh, Marty mentioned I was talking to Girl Scouts, and, and I always get the question, have you been to space? And of course, you have to say no, and they're crushed. And, but I always add, but you know, I'd love to. Well, then you see images like this, and you think six hours and 54 minutes, 263 miles above, that's the Indian Ocean. I'm like, oh, I'm not sure if I would. <laughs> I, might, I might hold their coat or something like that. But this is absolutely amazing. And so this is uh, Kayla and she was joined um, with, with Raja Chari. Uh, the two of them did this, um, this spacewalk to put out or prepare for the, uh, the rolling um, rollout solar, solar array. That's right, the ISS rollout solar array. Um, and uh, th this is the second one they're deploying. There's another four to go and that will make a, a big increase on the power um, on the ISS. But uh, also, uh, you may have noticed uh, this morning, it was announced that Jessica Watkins will, uh, is, has been selected to go as part of the Crew 4 mission. She will be the first African-American woman to fly in space. And so that is just an amazing thing. That mission will go no earlier than uh, April 19th. And I've already signed up to take my kids to that historic event. So um, as you heard in our space weather panel, one of the things we're really, really committed to in heliophysics is supporting the Artemis mission as we go um, back to the moon and then on to Mars. And, you know, certainly you, you heard in really in, in so many different ways this morning that the sun is waking up, that solar, uh, tw solar cycle 25 is here. And so you're looking here at a, a flare, it's a M-class flare that happened in Ju uh, January, sorry, January of this year. I think it was actually the one that Jari showed the CME simulation for, yeah. Um, and so, you know, we in, in heliophysics, we work very closely with our partners, with our interagency partners, to really be able to, to provide this, this really crucial information, this crucial um, space weather information. You know, for us, it's kind of fun because we're on the science end and we want to push the boundaries, we want to do more, but it has this real world, real application. Not only are we protecting our astronauts, but we're also protecting technology. We saw, we talked about the Starlinks, but we, you know, we also um, protect our power grids, our pipelines and everything in between. And so uh, we take it very, very seriously um, uh, what we do with, um, with our, our uh, heliophysics fleet. And so this kind of brings me back around to what we do with the ISS. And so the ISS is, is also the home to many um, experiments that are helping us with climate change. And we heard a lot about that in the Earth Science panel. And what you're looking at here is uh, an animation. And this is the, uh, the sort of the global average temperature anomalies. And this is from the GIS um, surface temperature anomaly model or the GIS, GIS temp version four, which I think somebody talked about earlier today also. Um, and this is, you're looking at these anomalies, and these anomalies are kind of um, are based on a baseline that goes from 1951 to 1980. Um, and so, you know, one thing that we can see from this animation very clearly is something we all know, which is climate is changing. 
And so, you know, here on earth, we, and this is something Karen was chatting to me about earlier, and it, it was really struck a chord with me is we don't experience here on earth average global temperature change. We experience regional, sometimes very, very intense temperature change. And one thing you'll notice as we get towards the end of, of this animation is not only is the temperature changing, but there's a sudden increase in the most recent years in the rate of the change. And so here on Earth, we're experiencing these sort of regional changes. And these regional changes can be, you know, um, storm intensification, precipitation, sea level rising, flooding, very, very, very serious impacts that we, we, we feel, feel here on Earth. And of course, our scientists, we take them all as inputs and produce beautiful models like this. Um, but, you know, these intense regional um, events, uh, the, the changes that, that cause them are kind of governed by the many different um, processes and uh, mechanisms that are present in the water and the carbon cycles that kind of link together everything that we experience in our atmosphere, in our oceans, in our land, in our ice. And um, the, the science of these mechanisms and processes has, is not yet understood. Not only that, but the actual mechanisms themselves change as the climate changes. And so it makes it even more important the work that, that we do now. And NASA is really playing a, just this pivotal role in this, this science. It is such a critical time to do this. You know, it is definitely not a time to rest on our laurels. There is more work to be done and the work becomes more and more critical. But the one thing that we do is, you know, when we put together this unique vantage point in space, together with the power of the science and technology of NASA, we can really, really, really move this enterprise forward. Karen also talked about something very cool, which is, you know, farming from your phone. And, um, you know, being related to people in that, that farm in Iowa, I'm very, very aware of the challenges that farmers face. And, you know, they, so they have this tool, um, Open, Open ED, I think it is, uh, ET, somebody, somebody nod, ET. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so Open ET that actually allows um, the farmers to know how much water their fields have used, which allows them to then know how much they need to irrigate their, their farms moving forward. And it's also providing critical information to city managers on um, urban, urban heat and also coastline flooding. And so, you know, real world applications um, that, you know, that we see. And so, you know, we're really providing think inputs from health, to air and water um, contamination, to uh, you know, uh, uh, science, technology, medicine, everything to do with, with uh, also disaster, uh, disaster prediction and recovery. So much is being done with, uh, with our NASA science. And so you know, together we can do wonderful things. And so I will conclude by saying, you know, I, I think that certainly these are just snapshots of some of the things that, that we are doing. And I think that all of them are really hopeful and really inspiring as we move forward. You know, I also could have talked about a picture perfect landing on Mars. I could have talked about um, wildfire support provided by Earth Science. I could have talked about tests finding yet more exoplanets. And of course, I could have talked for hours about Parker Solar Probe going beneath the solar, uh, into the solar corona for the very first time into the inner corona. But all of these things we do because we do them together and we do them as one unified science community. And so when I talk to, to kids, I always say, you know, close your eyes and dream big. Because if you, if you can't dream it, you'll never do it. And so together we will dream big, we will work hard and we will do great things. Thank you very much. As long as they're not hard questions, yes. <laughs> All right, softball questions. <laughs> what inspired you to get into heliophilics? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so probably the offer of a PhD position was the first thing that got me into it. Um, but I, I mean, I always loved, I always loved space um, from a, a really young kid and, you know, growing up. So the one thing I do have in common with Thomas, I he usually makes this joke, but I do have a funny accent. Um, so, uh, you know, I grew up in England and the idea of working for NASA is like, it doesn't happen. You know, you, when you're young, you don't get on a plane and leave your whole family and travel to a foreign land and do, do great things. 
And so it was always something my dad would always say, wow, if you're going to do something in life, working for NASA must be like the best thing ever. And that kind of stayed with me all the time. Um, so I really, really loved space. And, and I was fortunate enough to get a position at Imperial College um, doing various different aspects of heliophysics, mostly studying the aurora, um, and then um, moved to, to Goddard and started working on the cusp regions. And then I went to APL and started working on the radiation belts. And then I worked on solar probe. And then I worked on IMAP on the very edge of the heliosphere. So I probably really am a heliophysicist because I've actually touched all of them. But I think, you know, the thing that inspires me, um, and it, I think, it, you know, it, it really is the same. I think any division director would stand here and say the same thing. But you work on science that really has impact. And, you know, and, it, and what we do is important. And whether or not you're predicting climate change, whether or not you're putting a, you know, a perfect rover down on Mars, whether or not you're, you're helping um, people do it, what, what we do really has impact. And I think that's what really motivates us. But I do like studying the sun because I get to go to warm places. The Aurora I used to go to really cold places. So I'm much more of a solar scientist than Aurora. Anyone else? Yes. Um, what, what was it that got you to Space. Did you read science fiction? Did you <laughs> see some launch or what, what started that love of space? Uh, really, my dad started my love of space. Um, he actually, you know, he would, um, he was just fascinated by all of the NASA programs. He followed all of the, you know, from, from all of the astronaut programs, he was absolutely fascinated. He worked in the, um, he worked for General Motors, so he was very used to technology and and uh, motor engines, but he would say, wow, you know, to build a rocket must be just incredible. And so that, that kind of inspired me for space um, from a very early age. I didn't read science fiction until I was older, probably 16 or 17. And then I was really picky because if it didn't make, if, if I, in two, if, if in three or four pages, I went, well, that can't happen, I wouldn't read it. But, um, but uh, so, so really being interested in space was from my dad. Um, but science, I just loved science. I literally love science from the first day at school you know it was always my favorite subject and I you know people always say oh you must be you know must be really smart if you're a scientist I'm like no I'm really not but I really like asking questions <laughs> and I really 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 like knowing more and you know it's it's so that's that was the kind of thing that really motivated me and then it was just a dream come true to to get offered a job at Goddard Space Flight Center and uh you know, and that was that was a pivotal moment that that obviously changes. You know, it, you 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 can pinpoint in your life the one pivotal moment. It was when Jim Slavin walked up to me in Alaska when I was giving a poster and said, "Can I interest you in working in NASA?" And I was like, "Yeah, okay, sure." <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyone else? Scott, maybe 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 maybe. Uh... Maybe less of a softball, but uh, uh, maybe thinking of the kind of the deep What's going on right now in terms of uh, helping our European colleagues on ExoMars and other science and now that the thing we were going to put off with the Russians? Uh, what, uh, what sort of the current thought is it about kind of helping them out to do their science locally? Uh, so certainly we're, we're negotiating very closely and working with them and looking at what we can do. Laurie Glaze is, of course, um, working on that very closely with Thomas. I don't have a definitive answer for you because we've, we're really looking at what the possibilities are and how we can recover those things. But um, other countries, other agencies also um, coming into the, the fore as well to, to see what we can do to keep the science, the science enterprise moving forward. Um, but uh, it, it's actually, it's nice to see interagencies, different agencies coming, uh, interagencies and also international partners really stepping up to say, okay, this is an important mission and what can we do to help? Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here.